I'm just so excited to be the speaker at 115. People, people ask preachers to speak at 115 for one of two reasons. Either they figure this is somebody who will keep people awake, or they figure that this is someone in whose lectures everybody always sleeps, and it doesn't matter anyway. And, and one of my fellow preachers came to me just a moment ago and said, you know, you know this is 115, you know that people are going to sleep through this. Well, I really appreciate the encouragement. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I am so happy to see you here, and uh, I just, to comfort you about that, I know some of your names, not all of your names. If you go to sleep, and I know your name, I will call it out loud, so do your best, do your best. It's just a, a real honor for Cindy and me to get to come to East Hill and to be uh, here, and I'm standing in Jonathan's pulpit, and, and there was a time when I was 23 years old, and this is where I preached, and, and to be able to stand here and put my hands on this pulpit is always just, just a real exciting stroll down memory lane. There's some wonderful verses of Scripture that are precious to us that are impacted and enlarged in our hearts when, when we consider other passages first. Hebrews 13 and verse 4, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Isn't that precious? Isn't that sweet? Or in Matthew 28, when you conclude the Great Commission, as Matthew records it, And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Love that, don't you? But I declare to you that I can enlarge. I mean, if we focus on some other passages first and then consider those, oh, they're so much better. Let's talk about the roaring lion for a second. Now, now this business, of course, this is 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Let me get this clicker going here. What about this roaring business? This is just a coincidence, but this morning when Cindy and I were getting ready to come, I was in the living room, and I passed this big window, and out by the sidewalk, we have a lot of chipmunks out there. Now, they're kind of pesky, but anyway, one, one, there, there was a hole that he was going down in, and he could dart so quickly up and out, out of that hole, and directly I, I looked again, and there was a cat. I don't know whose cat this is, but the cat was, was crouched by that hole staring at it. You know what he was doing? He was waiting. He wasn't, he wasn't flexing. And you could tell that, that every little bit he would hear something and, and his, his backside would kind of come up and then it wasn't anything, so he'd, he'd just relax down again. And he was very patient. Now, see, that's the nature of a cat. That's how a cat operates. He was ready for his prey. What's this business about a roaring lion in 1 Peter 5, 8, that Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? Well, you, you can go through the, the Bible, Old and New Testaments, and find different occasions where roaring lion is referenced. And I'm going to show you some of those. We'll walk down through this, but I want you to understand from the get-go that this is about uh, boasting. It, it's, it's about not... There's no reason for me to have to, to crouch down and to be quiet and walk on the pads of my soft feet. It's not necessary. I've got what I want. I can have it any time I want. And so it's a roaring lion. And yet you find that kind of attitude at the foot of the cross. About a thousand years before Jesus was crucified, David, the prophet, said this in Psalm 22 in describing the cross and all preachers need to preach sometimes from Psalm 22. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. You know what? They were roaring. They were roaring. He saved others. He cannot save himself. If he be the cross, Christ, if, if God will have him, let him come down and we'll believe him. What's that? They're just, listen, it makes you tremble to realize that they're, they're mocking the Son of God. There's a great day coming, and one day they're going to be judged by the one who they mock. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, we must all appear before him, before him. You know what they're doing? They're mocking him like a roaring lion. 
And that's how, that's how the psalmist describes them. Here's Proverb 19, 12. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion who can stop him. He's got what he wants. He, he has no, nothing that fetters him, nothing that stops him. What about 28, 15? As a roaring lion and a raging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. Or Ezekiel 22, 25. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made their, her many widows in the midst thereof. Nothing can stop me. I don't need to prowl around. I don't need to tiptoe. I can have what I want and have it when I want. Now, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Sober means seeing things as they really are. Vigilant means to be awake, wide awake, because your adversary, the devil, walks about, are you ready for this? Like a roaring lion. There's a confidence in that. I can have you whenever I want. There's a pride in that. You, you, you don't believe me? Watch devil go to Job in the first couple of chapters and see how he talks to the Almighty. Or you take him to Matthew chapter 4 and listen to him as he mocks the son. If you be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. What is that but brazen? He's a roaring lion. The verse goes on, seeking whom he may devour. That's an interesting Greek word, devour. You, you would think that it means to gobble up, but, but, but it doesn't. It, it means to gulp down. It means to drink down or to gulp all of it leading some to suggest that, that maybe he has, you, you, you're talking about the time of Nero in 64, I assume is, I mean, traditionally, Peter is killed. And you think about the, the lions to whom the Christians would sometimes be fed and the, the blood of Christians would, would redden the lips of lions, seeking whom he may devour. One more thing, and this, this may not be, this may just be incidental, uh, this is New King James, and it says, like a roaring lion. The, the Greek would, would prefer the word as, and maybe you would assume that as and like are the same thing. I'm not so sure that it is. That, that Greek word's found about 450 times in the New Testament. 342 of them is translated as instead of like, and perhaps it suggests that, that that's what the devil is. He is more like a roaring lion personified. He is he comes as the roaring lion. I want you to, to revisit those verses now. And we talk about temptation. And, and one thing that I know for sure, that, that this is a subject applicable to everybody in this room. I mean, there, there are none of us who, who would say, I, I just don't wrestle with temptation. Of course you do. And everybody in this room understands something about the boldness, the brazenness of a being who would not be threatened by us. He would, he, would not, he would not be dissuaded by us. He would just presume that he could have us when he wanted us. And that's the essence of the idea of the, the, the roaring lion. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But now listen to these verses. I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the earth. And we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was tempted in all points, like as we are. Incidentally, parenthetically, that, that doesn't mean that every conceivable sin Jesus was tempted to commit. It doesn't mean that. It, it, it cannot mean that. There, there are sins that sometimes people t today commit, and he couldn't commit them. It's impossible for me to commit the sin of disrespecting my husband. Only a wife can do that, and I'll never be a wife. There's some sins. It just cannot mean that Jesus was tempted with every conceivable sin. It, it means that every kind of sin, every category of sin, Jesus faced, yet without sin. All right, six things. Five, let's do five or six things I, I want to talk about relative to temptation. Now, what I want to do is to try to make this as practical as I can. You, you, uh, you think about the things which tempt you, 
And I want you to focus on what's number one. In your life right now, what would you say is the number one thing that tempts you the most? I'm not going to ask you what it is. That's up to that's up, it's your business. But I want you to appreciate the fact that behind it is the devil. In Matthew 4, Jesus refers to Satan as the tempter. And in 2 Corinthians 2.11, and this is really is the, the heart of this lesson about the roaring lion. We're not ignorant of his devices. And the word devices means his mindset, his, his ways. All right, here we go. I'm going to give you some points all relative to the subject of temptation. Some things that we need to realize about temptation. Number one. It exists because God allows it to exist. So Genesis 3, 6. Now I want you to look at these words. I underlined them in order that we could pick up on this. That yeah, this, is, this is woven with the, with the sense of temptation. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband. I underline that because surely she was so very tempting to her husband. I don't know what, what he was thinking. Maybe he was thinking that she's now committed this sin and I don't know where she's going, but I can't bear to be without her, so I'm going to eat it too. She gave it to her, her husband with her and, and he ate. And so it, it was permitted. Now how come is that? And how do you deal with that in your psyche? How come if God loves me so much, does he have me living in a world where there's temptation, and we long for the time we can, when we can be on the other side and be free from it, don't we? So how come, how come he put us in this place where we've got to struggle with temptation all of our lives? And the answer is, and this is overly simplistic, I guess, but I think it's the answer, is that he wanted, he wanted voluntary servants. That's it. I mean, he, he wanted people to choose to serve him. Now the downside to that is that if they can choose to serve you, they can also choose to forsake you. And the skeptic then would criticize that mindset and say, I don't know about your God. I mean, after all, aren't you admitting that, that he then created an atmosphere in which, in which temptation and sin would occur? And doesn't that make God culpable for sin? Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. Isn't God culpable? Doesn't he have a role? To, did, did, I mean, doesn't he, doesn't, isn't he one who created a circumstance where he knew that you would sin, and so doesn't that make him a part of your sin? No, I would say no. It fails to appreciate the significance of what's really going on. You, 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 you take a, a man who buys his son a bicycle, I think every boy and girl ought to have a bicycle. Bought my children bicycles. He doesn't will that they should fall down when he gives them the bike or that they, they should break their lip, bust the lip, you know, or hurt their arm. Can it happen? Yeah, yeah. And he bought the bike. But the bike, the bike of the bike, does that somehow imply that he wills for them to be hurt? And the answer to that is of course no. If a committee gets together and they, they make rules for a football game, does that somehow make them culpable if, if the guys come and they break those rules? And the answer, of course, is no. You, here, here's a man who buys a house and moves his family and young children into that house, and there's an electric cook stove in the house. And he, and he brings his daughter over and he explains about the cook stove. Now, honey, you might not understand why we have to have a cook stove, but we have to have a cook stove. But I don't want you to touch it now, because if you touch it, it's going to burn you. So you stay away from this. Now, he created that environment in which that cook stove exists, and, and this could happen. But you wouldn't say that somehow he's culpable if she hurts herself. He created the environment and warned her against it. It is not his will that, that she be hurt. God created this world, put Adam and Eve there, and he says, don't, but don't sin because you'll hurt yourself. And they chose to do that. And in your own life, I want you to wrestle with it this way, that, that God is love and that God isn't willing that any should perish, that any should sin, but that all should come to repentance. Here's the second one. 
The devil uses different tactics to attack each person. By that I mean it's rather individualistic. James chapter 1 and verse 14. Every man is tempted of his own lust. Oh, I think that's very interesting. The word own there is the Greek word idios from the word, well, we get that, our word um, idiot, but it doesn't mean idiot. It's also the word from which we get our word idiosyncrasy. And, and you know what that means. It means unique. And the point then here is every man is tempted of his own lust. That means unique to him. Now, there are three things I want you to get under this point. The devil uses different tactics for every person, and, and, and it's different about quantity. I, I think about Luke 22 and 31. Remember Jesus said to, to, to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat. What does that mean? Well, you know, the, the sift would separate the, the, the grain from the chaff. And, and Satan was trying to, sep, trying to separate Peter from his faith. But the point I want you to get is that it indicates that, I mean, that, that the devil doesn't merely tempt all people in a blanket way all at the same time, you know. I know that he's the prince of the power of the air, but what it says here is that he's focusing his attention on you, Simon. Is there any reason to believe that the devil doesn't do the same thing today? No, no reason to believe that he wouldn't. I tell you what, that's a frightening reality, isn't it? Now, we'll talk some more about this in a minute, but is there any reason to believe that, that he doesn't individual, individualistically choo, individually choose people and, and focus his attention on them? So number one, it's the quantity. But it's also in reference to the specific sin. In Mark 14, 38, you know, in the garden, Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. It's interesting to me that, that, that what tempts me might not tempt you. Is that a true statement? I, I'm telling you that the devil uses different tactics to attack each person, and, and we're different about that. We're not different. I mean, we're all, we're all tempted, but how he does it, and the thing with which he tempts us, that's very different. I have a good friend who's an alcoholic. He's a Christian. He's my age. But all of his adult life, he's gone from sober to inebriated, up and down and up and down. And, and he's, he's pitiful. And I, I've, I've told him many times that there are two of you, and one wants to kill the other. And sometimes, you know, he, he would not call, couldn't reach him for a couple of weeks. And I would know. I would know what has happened. You know, he's, he's drinking again, and so he would drink for days and days. And so one day I saw him, and I, brother, where have you been? Oh, he said, you know, it happened again. Uh, I'm sorry. How did it start? Because we've got to know that. And if we're going to help, what we have to know is what triggered this. And well, he said, I was, I was in a, a quick mart, and, and I went in just to get a Coca-Cola, and I had it in my hand, but there were two or three people there in line to pay, and I was behind them, and right there beside me, there was this cooler of ice with beer in it, and now listen to me, Christians, that does not tempt me one whit. I, if I had a case right now of the finest Tennessee sipping whiskey, it wouldn't bother me a snap. I'd never open up a bottle of it. I don't care anything about that. Nothing about that appeals to me. That is not my temptation, but I assure you it is his temptation. He can't get anywhere near it. It just drives him crazy. Isn't that funny? I mean, how that is? That, that we're different about what, what tempts us and what tempts one man. I, I, I know a gospel preacher. He used to be a gospel preacher, and his, his temptation was gambling. He was eat up with it, and, and he was destroying relationships, and I remember saying to him, now look, you've got this one chance, one more chance, and it's all, I'm telling you that everything is, you've got one shot at this. It's going to be the gambling, or it's going to be your family, and your pulpit, and your influence, and your Lord, and you, you can't gamble anymore. And that so we set some practices in place to help him overcome it, put some, some system to it where he could be accountable and not gamble anymore. 
so much at stake. There wasn't any time till he was gambling again. And he lost it all. I don't understand that. I'm, I'm telling you that there's nothing in me that understands why a man would be tempted to gamble. I, I have no, no, no... See, this is not bragging. I'm telling you, I have, my, I have temptations of my own, and so do you. That just doesn't have to be one. I, I've often said, if I ever change my mind about gambling, I'm not going to play the lottery. I'm going to buy a casino. That's where the money is, you know. They're not really gambling. Yeah, they know. <laughs> what I want you to understand about this, this number two point is that the devil uses different tactics for each of us. That's in reference to quantity. It's in reference to the specific sin. And there's one more thing I want you to get. About sometimes people, you know, sometimes their temptation is sexual. And it's already been mentioned today that, that, that we're... we're we're dealing with terrible, terrible problems relative to pornography in the country and in the church. And the numbers, you know, I, you, you really want to get shook up. You, you check out the numbers for our Christian universities and, and see what it'll do. I don't suppose a study has been done about MSOP. And I, I would assume that the numbers would be better. I don't know what they would be, but I can tell you this. This is a profound temptation with which the devil has hit people hard. And here's the third one I want to put under this point, which is it's this, is that our attitude toward others and their temptation needs to, needs to be commensurate with the, the universality of this the fact that we suffer from our own temptations, the fact that I don't, I don't suffer with a temptation for alcohol or gambling does not mean that I don't suffer with temptation. And you know that, you know that we all do. What I'm thinking about now is this. I, I had, oh, I've had more than once someone come to me and say, well, Glenn, what do you think about the temptation of homosexuality? And don't you think, do you think that it's a sin to be tempted this way? And the answer to that is no. It cannot be the case that it's a sin to be tempted to sin. My Lord was tempted, wasn't he? In Matthew 4, it's not a sin to be tempted, it's a sin to give in to the temptation. But I declare to you that my attitude toward someone who is tempted to homosexuality, I never have been, but, but to be tempted to homosexuality must be an awful thing. I will not look, we must not look on people with contempt because they have have a temptation that's different from ours. You have temptations in your life that you wrestle with, you struggle with? How, how, how can people who are tempted by the devil, by this lion, how can they be contemptuous toward people who are tempted in a way different from them? So in this point, again, the devil uses different tactics to attack each person. Everyone is tempted of his own lust and enticed. Now here's the next thing. The devil's going to win if I lose my resolve not to sin. Now here's Romans 6 and 17 with which you're familiar. You were the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered to you. And being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Now I'll ask you a question. What? So what kind of sin would be one where you'd become a slave to it? What kinds of sin come to mind when I reference being a slave to sin? And I suppose you might think of the kinds of sin which are the most addictive. And in your mind right now, you have a list. I, I would just say that that's not it. That's not the answer to the question. The answer to the question is that any sin can be, can be the one that destroys me. And the critical issue is my resolve. I have to maintain resolve against sin. That's kind of funny about the way the devil works with sin. I mean, you take a Christian who sins in a particular way the first time and it just eats him up. Don't you suppose that when Judas first took money from the treasury that it just tore him up? Nobody was surprised when Judas was selected to be one of the apostles. Nobody said, I, I can't believe that you're asking him to do, don't you know that he's a dishonest man? I don't suppose he was dishonest. And, and assuming that I'm right about that, then when the first time he took money out of that treasury, don't you know that it just hurt him? 
I always thought that probably what happened was that he didn't just overtly think, I think I'll steal from the Lord's money here. I expect what happened was he was holding the bag and he, and he thought, look, I'm a little short right now and I need a few dollars. So I, but, and I get paid next Tuesday and I think I'll just borrow a little money out of the treasury and I'll put it back next Tuesday. Next Tuesday came and yeah, that money didn't come through. And then it was another week and a week after that and suddenly he, he realized he couldn't put the money back but he needed some more. And one thing led, leads to another. And the point is that how many, how many times before, you know how sin is. You, 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 that first time it really hurts, but then you start logicking this thing out. You reason, well, you know what? I've already done it once. There's not too much more guilt attached to doing it twice than doing it once. So maybe again. And then before long, when I was a kid preacher, I remember the preachers, maybe some still, still do it, it's a good thing, but talk about how that sometimes people's knuckles go white when, when the invitation song is being sung because they know, because they know. But what I want to know is how long, how many times do you hear the gospel before, before that's no longer necessary to keep you out of that aisle? How, how long before you, you can listen to discussion about the cross of Jesus dying, and dying for your sins and and it not phase you. Bobby Duncan, my wife's uncle, was a great gospel preacher, and he used, to, he used to use this illustration, and maybe you've heard it, he would say, you can take an alarm clock, and one of those old West Bend kind with the big, big bells on the top, you know, and key wine clock, and you can set it for 2 a.m. And, and go to, go to bed, and you'll go to sleep. And when that thing goes off at 2, it will knock you out of the bed. You shut it off, and it'll take you a little while to get back to sleep. But keep doing that every night. And in and, and a, and a couple of weeks, what's going to happen is that you'll wake up in the morning, and you'll look over at the clock. The mainspring that, that drives that bell will have been depleted, but somebody obviously turned the clock off. And you know that it was you, but you don't remember doing it. Now, what I want you to think about, about temptation in your life, is this point. The devil can win your soul before you even smell the smoke of hell. If you lose your resolve to not sin, the problem is that, that we may just give up on some particular sin and give way to it. I've got to maintain my resolve to not sin. So remember 1 Corinthians 6 and, and where are you right now in your life? I mean, in reference to sin, in reference to temptation. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Don't be deceived. And this, this list, look at this. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, and I like that because I want you to appreciate that these were Christians who had been involved in those things. But, but look at the next line. But you were washed sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, I don't have to be defined by sin. What I've got to do is to maintain my resolve. Here's what I challenge you to do, and I have myself in the process. Here is the challenge, is that giving in to sin, and sometimes I will. You know First John chapter 1, verse 7? I... I I know that sometimes I will sin out of weakness, out of foolishness, out of ignorance sometimes. But it needs to be an anomaly. It needs to be an exception to who I am. Just make sure that when you occasionally sin out of these sad realities of life, if we say we have no sin but deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, walk in the light as he is in the light and we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ the Son cleanses us from all sin. So i got to walk in the light. What does that mean? And, and, I, and you, can, you can phrase it different ways. I suggest this one. Live your life following the Lord and the New Testament to the point that when you do sin, it's an exception to who you are and not the natural course of who you are. Is that where you are? Which one are you? Do not give in to any, but what, what's on your list? What, so so make, you make this list of what things tempt you and what's at the top. What's number one? Don't give in to that. When, when does he have us? When does he win? And the answer is, when I lose my resolve to not sin. 
Number four, as much as possible, we should cross the bridge of sin before we get to it. How do you do that? How do you do it? I, I think there are two ways. There are two that I, I want to put in your heart, I want you to think about in reference to your own temptations. What things tempt you, you, you know what they are. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you cross the bridge before you get to it? You don't want to wait till you get to it in reference to sin. Don't do that because you're more apt to sin. You've got to, you got to, to do this in advance. I would suggest to you that the best time to decide what you will do about a given sin, or I should say a given temptation, you want to know the best time? It's when you're eating the Lord's Supper. I expect that's largely the significance of unleavened bread. You know, you go back to the people of Israel being delivered by God from Egyptian bondage and the Passover feast and, and the, it's got to be unleavened. You've got to sweep the leaven out of your I mean all of the leaven has to get out of your house. And then you come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in the New Testament church and what you find is that typically, not exclusively, but typically leaven represents sin and, and, and that it grows. If it's allowed to do so, it'll grow in our lives and, and you eat the Lord's Supper and you're eating unleavened bread and why is that true? I suggest to you that in the process of eating the Lord's Supper tomorrow and eating the unleavened bread, you sweep your heart of the, the sins that doth so easily beset you. That's the point. You want to know the best time to make up your mind about the sin that tempts you the most? While you're sitting there eating the Lord's Supper. And that's when I want you to think about this list. The list. Think about them. Go down the line and say, Here's what I'm going to do when I face that temptation. Here's what I will do. But the second thing on this list of two, under this point, how do, you, how do you cross the bridge of sin before you get to it? And I would suggest that you pray this prayer. In the model prayer of Matthew 6, Jesus included this line, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I want to ask a question. How do you suppose God does that? I mean, some critics would argue, some skeptics would argue that this evidence is that sometimes God puts us into temptation. Now, I understand Genesis chapter 22, and I understand there are times, it's been discussed this morning already, that, that God would, would try our faith. I think he, I mean, I'm, I know he does that. It's, 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 in the, it's God's business that he would, he would put Christians, his people, sometimes in difficult situations like he did Abraham, to, to tempt or to try their faith. But, but setting that aside, I don't believe that's what this is talking about at all. Jesus said, now you pray like this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, think about this thought. You may disagree with me. Think about it and see if you do. So when you pray before you take a long trip, Father, give us safety as we drive. Bring us back home safely. What do you expect him to do. And when you get home, you pray in gratitude, Father, thank you for blessing us with safety. What did he do? I mean, you're attributing something to him. You're thanking him for something. So how do you suppose he got involved and you're, so did he do something? You're thanking him. I suppose he must have. At least you believe that he did. What would that be? And the answer is, that we believe as Christians that God works providentially in our lives. And Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 says, The angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are going to inherit eternal life. That, that's you. That's you. And, and the angels are ministering spirits to you and to me. I, I would suggest that the angels carry out God's providential care of his people. And, and so, you're departing from the house. You don't know it, but the reality is that your car, because you're leaving at 9.03, in 45 miles is going to intersect at exactly the same time a drunk driver is going to come. Right? I mean, you know what? It is, that precision is there, and you're about to, when you pull out of that driveway, you've set this in motion, and you're going to be there at that exact time. How difficult would it be for God providentially? 
to divert you for 10 seconds. When I think about my list of things which tempt me, I, I assure you, I do not want the devil like he did in Luke twenty two thirty one 31 with Peter to, to focus his attentions directly onto me and hit me as hard as he can with that temptation. I do not want him to do that. And I would suggest to you that this part of the prayer, lead us not into temptation, is to pray, I do not know what this day will bring forth. I do not know the paths I will cross today. But I pray to you to help me to avoid the danger spots in reference to temptation the same way I pray when I ask him to protect me on a trip that I'm driving. Again, as much as possible, we should cross the bridge of sin before we get to it. Now, here's the final one. The God of the universe has your back. And here's 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. And the Bible says this, No temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. You're not so unique, you know. But God is faithful. And incidentally, in this passage, that's the constant. The constant is that you serve a God who is always faithful, always dependable. But God is faithful, who will not permit you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation make also a way of escape. Now, it doesn't mean... When I talk about God having your back, that he's going to keep you from choosing sin. You still have that choice. And remember, the reason is that God wants you to be able to choose to do right. He wants you to choose to serve him. Not because you have to, but because you love him. And so he's, he's going to give you that choice. Just like he said to Cain, if you do well, you'll be accepted. And if not, sin lies at the door. That's right. It's the same about you and me. We've always, we've always got that choice. The next verse is going to say, well, I want you to flee idolatry. So it's not saying that he's going to keep us away where we cannot sin. But he's always going to make a way of escape. Let that, let that seat deep in your heart in reference to your temptation. There's always going to be a way. There's always, and it may be, you know, like we like to say, it, in some, it could be like Joseph and Potiphar's wife, you know, a good pair of Nikes and the king's highway, Right? And you just get out of there. There's always a way of escape. James 1 and 14 says, every man is tempted. I don't know why it's true. I mean, it'd be wonderful to be in heaven, won't it? You know what? We're not going to have that gnawing temptation and that fight, that constant fight that we must endure to stay away from sin. Sin is an enigma. Sin is, is strange. You think about that first sin with Adam and Eve. It doesn't make any sense, does it, I mean, on, on his face? They're staring down the barrel of God's wrath and the very idea. And, and the anomaly or the, the enigma of sin is, is more strange to us when you think about the smallness of the benefit and the largeness of the consequence. And it doesn't make any sense, and yet it's so much a part of life. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And that's going to be true. And it's also going to be true that Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And God sent his son to offer me a plan by which I could be saved and a plan by which I can live in a saved condition. And for that we're deeply grateful. And we must always, always live our lives resisting sin. Forgiveness is sweet, and I would, I would suggest this to you. If, if you get to talking, thinking about temptation as we have been today in these sessions, I, I want to remind you that, that if God sent his own son, is there anything that he wouldn't do for us? He, he wants you to be saved. He wants to forgive you. He will forgive you. And, and you make that right with your Lord. You, 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 you can make this right, the sin in your life. And make sure that your life isn't defined by sin. And let's keep pushing against the temptation. He's a roaring lion. But I declare to you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Thank you very much for your attention.